Good morning and welcome to Vermont House Judiciary Committee. It is Friday, May 7th, and we are continuing our discussion on H-417, an act relating to six-person juries in civil trials. And we are going to continue our discussion with Legislative Counsel Eric Fitzpatrick. So, good morning, Eric. Thank you so much. Good morning, everybody. Okay. So yesterday, Eric, I, I abruptly cut you off and, <laughs> and asked you to be very brief on what is um, actually quite a, um, I don't want to say complicated, but, but a topic that does have um, very compelling um, arguments on, on both sides and definitely needs more than the eight minutes that, <laughs> that I, mm -hmm. I um, allotted you yesterday. So um, so I know that Representative Lalonde has some, some questions and, and maybe that will start the, the conversation again in terms of the constitutionality of, um, of the bill, what the legal precedent is and um, how it might be interpreted these um, now in, in, in current times. So thank you. Go ahead, Martin. Yeah, um, I, yeah, I want to talk a little bit about uh, and understand from you, uh, uh, from you, Eric, um, as far as uh, what uh, constitutes uh, binding precedent versus uh, uh, dicta, which I think a lot of this kind of revolves around that. Um, I mean, as far as I see, you know, the issue, if I just you know, can kind of a little background where I'm coming from and then ask a couple questions or have you uh, clarify uh, that, that uh, that the concept of, you know there are these two concepts and you might meant talked about them a little bit yesterday. One is uh, st stare decisis. It essentially means that if a court has decided something, uh, the Supreme Court, in this case the Vermont Supreme Court, then the then the lower courts and the Supreme Court in the future are are bound by that previous precedent. Uh, the other concept is is. Uh, uh, is obiter uh, dictum or is it o obiter dictum? How do you pronounce that anyway? Like I can't. I, I have no idea. I don't know how it reads. I can spell Anybody it. Anybody take Latin? Anybody mm -hmm. take Latin in class? They could tell us. Any event. Um, so so that concept is that that you know any kind of comment or suggestion or an observation uh, of a judge that is in the in opinion that's not necessary to resolve the case. It is not legally binding. The stare decisis does not apply. And it's a tricky question. And there could be different opinions about that. And I think maybe Eric and I have slightly different opinions, but I'm not even sure if we do necessarily, of really looking at, well, the way I look at this is, uh, and the way I look at our question, you know, there's a lot of questions. There's a question of whether we want to do a six person jury, whatever the Supreme Court has said before. That's a separate question, but the question of, whether we're, uh, the Supreme Court is bound by this previous decision uh, would certainly go into uh, how we would be looking at our decision of whether to proceed. You know, on the one hand, if we're saying, yeah, we see that the Supreme Court is bound by this decision to apply it to a civil jury trial that we're talking about, then actually going out uh, and, and passing legislation that's contrary to that uh, but essentially is asking the court to revisit, as I think Eric said yesterday, uh, is certainly one thing. And we heard from witnesses, including uh, Rich Cassidy, that he wouldn't really like to do that. If, if the Supreme Court has decided and it's bound, you know, should the legislature really uh, question that? Um, but I guess the question that I have is, it seems to me that Certainly, and I've reread these uh, the main opinions that we've talked about, Eric. It seems like really the main opinion uh, that we have been discussing is State v. Peterson. And I've read that opinion, and it certainly has lots of persuasive, you know, uh, authority in there. I would say regarding whether whether the understanding back in those days was uh, that a jury as required or, or uh, in the state constitution was a common law jury of 12 men. Um, but 
it's in the context of a criminal case. And it would seem certainly that <clears throat> if back then, or even if now, if a Supreme Court took up a case that was asking whether a 12 person jury, <clears throat> I won't say 12 man jury, but a 12 person jury uh, is required for a civil action, uh, I would say that these previous cases could certainly be very, very persuasive, but, but would, they, would they be bound by those cases in applying it to the civil jury? And, and I do have a question coming, uh, Eric, and I do want you to rebut or respond to what I'm saying as well. Um, and one way that I'm looking at, that, at this is, would, if we did put this into place, this legislation into place, if we, if we mandated or even allowed at the order of a court to uh, have a six person civil jury, would a Supreme Court, if they were going to see that, which we understand they would, would they have to overturn this early, these earlier opinions to do that. And I think they're distinguishable because uh, it's a criminal, it's in the context of a criminal jury and there's lots of language in the cases really talking about uh, the importance of a, of, a, of a 12 man jury in a criminal trial. Uh, and it doesn't really necessarily apply to the civil trial. So, but here's, I guess the fun, a fundamental question is, is whatever the court has decided, I think clearly in the context of a criminal trial, does that necessarily mean that that's, the, that's what is required under the constitution for a, a civil trial? And maybe it does, uh, but I guess that's one of the questions, but I'd also like you to kind of respond uh, to, to what I've said, uh, Eric, because you know we've gone, we've talked a lot about this and I absolutely respect what your opinion is on this. It's just, I think on the edges, um, we have a slightly different uh, viewpoint, but that's fine. I mean, that happens with attorneys. Yeah, it's a good thing that it does because otherwise we'd all be out of work and there wouldn't be any need for courts or anything of that nature. So uh, I'm glad we disagree sometimes. And uh, Eric Fitzpatrick with the Office of Legislative Counsel here to follow up on the uh, cornucopia of questions that Representative Lalonde just uh, folded into that <laughs> one bit of <laughs> remark there. Uh, the, uh, and yes, I think that's the right representative Alonda. I have a lot of respect for, for you and everyone else on the committee and, and the witnesses that you heard from as well. And uh, sometimes attorneys see things differently. It doesn't, uh, it's nothing personal at all. And, um, uh, uh, sometimes we see things the same. Um, uh, but in this particular case, yeah, it does seem like maybe we see the, the precedent a little bit differently. Uh, I, I view the Peterson case as uh, more binding, I suppose, than you do, uh, just based on what I, I think I'm hearing you hearing you mention. Uh, um, and I, I don't think the criminal context, well, I guess I would say it's because of the way the court framed the question for itself is the reason that I look at it that way. I think you, you're absolutely right that it arose in the criminal context. Um, the court could have said, this is limited to criminal cases, but it didn't. Um, it seemed to make sort of broad statements about what the word jury meant under the constitution that weren't limited to the criminal context. And um, I think that the way that it framed the question for it, that it was deciding, uh, seemed to um, uh, encompass the idea of the number of persons who should be on the jury. In other words, not just whether the person had a right to a jury at all, because it came out of a case in Burlington where in the Burlington police court, uh, the uh, maximum number of jurors that a person might have would be six. Uh, but really the question in some sense that the court was looking at was, well, could, the, could a jury right be suspended under those circumstances completely? Um, but it seemed to, seemed to uh, state, restate the question for itself as to be whether or not this provision in the Burlington Charter uh, that provided for a six person jury um, was constitutional under the Vermont jury clauses. And in reaching that conclusion, it said no, and it seemed to be saying, it did say ex explicitly that the jury right was 12 people. Um, I might, uh, one thing I got, well, I, I do want to get to the point about, because I don't think the court would need to overrule Peterson or any other cases in order to 
reach a different result with respect to its own emergency authority. I think that that's a separate issue. I, I, maybe I'll talk about that first because this is consistent with what I testified in the Senate, and this is why I made this distinction, that you recall that this committee has actually spent some time, I think it was in H-133, talking about the inherent authority of the judiciary. The court has some inherent authority during emergency circumstances uh, to take actions that it would not otherwise be able to do. As an example of this, uh, for example, uh, the in 1990, the Supreme Court of Vermont decided a case called In Re Vermont Supreme Court Administrative Order, Administrative Directive Number 17 versus the Vermont Supreme Court, in which it held that it uh, had the ability to suspend the right of civil jury trials complete for six months in that period because of the emergency circumstances that they had run out of money. Uh, the budget was dry, they didn't have any money, and they were, it was challenged constitutional, constitutionally by some plaintiffs. Well, I shouldn't say that. I don't know that it was by some plaintiffs. It was challenged by some parties uh, as a violation of the right to a jury trial. So I, I think, and the court said that it was okay. And it, it emphasized that it was an emergency and temporary situation. And uh, it said that it had the administrative authority to do that in, the, in this emergency. So. Uh, again, that's no guarantee that that I, I hear the argument too that that um, and I heard it yesterday from I think uh, both witnesses. <laughs> so in a way, I'm parting ways with both of them with this with this view. But uh, but it is consistent with I, what I said in the Senate, which I think it's a different story if the court is acting in an emergency capacity, emergency temporary capacity uh, to do something to regulate the. Uh, uh, and protect the litigants is another phrase that's used during these emergency authority cases. A in that situation, to protect the litigants in an emergency in a temporary fashion. Again, I I'm not saying I, I have that that that's the answer. I'm just saying I think there's a better argument in that situation for uh, being able able to for the court to be able to say we can do this on a short term basis. Um, right. Uh, as opposed to the legislature passing a statute saying this is the way it has to be. Um, so that's a question about that real separate quick? issue, but yeah. Yeah. So can I, can I just ask a question just to clarify on what you just said, right, right, right there. Yes. Yeah, so that would not, if they did that, then we're, then they're not really running up against these earlier opinions. It, would that be your, your, yeah. Okay. Exactly. All right. Thanks. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Eric. I think I think that's a really important point to hang on to as we continue this this discussion. Yeah. Go ahead. Right. Yeah. I think that whatever, however, we see these precedents with respect to the legislature's ability to pass a statute, that doesn't mean that six-person juries couldn't happen you know, in this other method that, that, that it couldn't be permitted or uh, authorized by the court or even ordered. Um, you know, again, as, as I've said before, you know, the, obviously the final word on whether that's constitutional is up to the court, but, but I certainly think there's a lot more leeway, particularly given the cases on the court's emergency authority for them to, to do that in an emergency temporary situation. So actually, Which, uh, reads me. So go ahead. Sorry. Well, no, we go ahead because maybe you're going where I'm going. <laughs> go ahead. I doubt it. I was just going to throw out a funny, a funny. <laughs> one of my favorite law legal quotes is always that. Uh, um, how's it go? It's the uh, the uh, this this the Supreme Court is not does not have the final word because they're infallible, but they're infallible because they have the final word. So you know they. <laughs> Their, their view is the last one, the final one. <laughs> That's great. Uh, yeah. Thank you. That's great. Tom. Thank you. Eric, uh, I guess, can you talk about how, uh, and maybe you kind of covered it, but how this kind of would muddy the water, so to speak, between the branches of government if we pass something like this? Well, um, you know, there is there is potentially a separation of powers issue lying in the background. I, I haven't really been 
getting at that so much because I, I think okay. the the um, the specific reference to jury trials in the Constitution is more what this is turning on. So um, it's possible. To be honest, I didn't go down that road too much. I I haven't been able to relocate it, but but when I almost went down the road a little bit, I thought I found a, a Connecticut Supreme Court case saying that uh, the a legislative decision to set the number of jurors was not a separation of powers violation. Uh, you know, um, but it's a separate issue. You know, set because we're talking about these specific jury requirements in the Constitution, kind of separate from whether or not it might also be a separation of powers issue. Um, right. But I haven't, right. haven't thoroughly looked into that. Right. So uh, again, um, I, I know you, you talked about it. So it's your, uh, I guess I'd say, opinion that you you think the courts already have the uh, the authority to do this. Well, I think there's a good argument that they do. Yeah. Right. Uh, right. Yes. I think uh, Which they, if they decided to go down that road, uh, the the appeals uh probably would still be there or could still be there sure yep yeah. I, I probably the same way the case that i just cited where 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 the court suspended civil jury trials completely for a while someone challenged it so i'm sure yeah it's likely someone would challenge it um or at least very possible right right yeah and uh and probably whoever loses like we heard yesterday <laughs> right yeah that could be <laughs> Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Eric, can can you remind me in the committee of, of where the Supreme Court, I know that Justice Eaton has a working group and it came up during judicial rules last week. And that was my that was my first meeting. Um, so can can you give us sort of some context and history about about that and where that stands? Thank you. Well, yeah, I think it was called the Jury Restart Committee and uh, they had been uh, you know, I think working to try and um, get procedures and processes in place and courthouses uh, set up uh, so that, you know, whether it's through HVAC systems and uh, uh, space requirements and that sort of thing to see how many, uh, uh, how many courts could be um, structured so that there would be it would be safe, basically, to have uh, a jury trial uh, of 12 people, I think is what they were assuming, um, during the pandemic. Uh, as it happens, uh, I don't, I won't be able to remember at all the, the specifics of this, but as it happens, uh, Judge Grierson testified, I think yesterday morning in Senate Judiciary, and he went through which individual courts were ready to get started and which were, were not. And I think there were nine or 10 maybe um, that I think were pretty close to up to speed. So that was kind of a status report. Okay, yeah, thank you. So, and he, he actually spoke to us about that too. So it, oh. so still looking at, yeah, so we're still, still looking at 12 person injuries. That, that, all right, that's helpful. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Martin. Just on that issue, I, I think he he talked about a number of courts being available or ready for six person juries, but not 12 person juries, and then some are ready for 12. But unless unless they order, unless the court orders uh, six person juries, you know, those courts are likely not to be used because what we're really hearing is people are not agreeing uh, to six person juries. Uh, but uh, so, so I think, you know, just following up on what Tom said as well, I, I mean, I would, I, I do believe if the court were to look again at these uh, uh, old uh, cases and the rationale that talked about uh, 12 men, you know, that being kind of one problem with it, but of course that that's not binding anymore for other reasons uh, that, that the court may very well find that in a civil context, six person juries fine but but I think yeah I, I'm, I'm reluctant particularly after your uh, strong opinions on this uh, to, to go through this with a legislative uh, requirement of six person juries and just really hope that the court does the right thing and and order six person juries and the issue can come up through the appellate process 
through that route, as I think uh, uh, Tom was suggesting, because I really think that it should be revisited, but you know, they can revisit it on their own perhaps instead of us kind of setting that up. So that's kind of where, where I am, but the language, I guess, and now I'm understanding more and more the language that was crafted in the budget bill, which seems to go about as far as we can without saying, hey guys, why don't you order six person right. jury? <laughs> right. <laughs> which would be a separation of power issue, of course, I think. But actually, Eric, if you could, if you could talk about the, the language in the budget, yeah, that would be awesome. Be, that would be helpful because that's that's how we got here. <laughs> um, right. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I don't have it right in front of me, but uh, I believe that uh, it it provided that you know there was a certain sum that was appropriated to the court for purposes of um, you know getting getting back off the ground following the COVID pandemic, and then within that sum, it said there was language that said it's the intent of the General Assembly uh, that a certain portion of it uh, be used uh, for purposes of six person jury trials, uh, six, sorry, six person civil jury trials and civil cases uh, to the extent that the court's emergency authority uh, uh, permitted. That's probably not a verbatim. It's a good paraphrase. I have language in front here, but it's a good paraphrase. That's, that's okay. good. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, so that was roughly it, and that was that was the idea that that it was encouraging uh, the court to exercise this emergency authority that I was just describing earlier. That the view was that at least there's a good argument that under that authority, in fact, I, I believe uh, the letter that Senate the Senate Judiciary Committee wrote to the court a couple of months ago also referred to that, and also encouraging the court to. Uh, implement six person jury trials on the basis of its emergency authority. Uh, it, oh, sorry, it's inherent authority to take actions like that during emergencies. Um, so the, uh, the language in the budget was intended to sort of have a similar basis in that, uh, that uh, the understanding being that at least arguably the court already has that authority because of the emergency nature of the COVID pandemic and that, um, that it could take a temporary step without, without violating these previous cases that said, seemed to say, arguably said, <laughs> that uh, 12, 12 people were required. They sort of were able to, the idea was you avoid that question, avoid that argument, because you're just encouraging the court to use authority, which it seems to be, a, a, you know, you're on solid, solid ground saying that they have. But again, that's just one approach. Um, you know, I still, I still also do. I know it may not be the policy choice of the committee, but I, I still also think that it is a legitimate choice if you were to want to make it to say we think those 150-year-old cases are should be revisited, and we want to provide the court with an opportunity to do that. So, um, you know, we're going to pass this statute, knowing that, will, you know, there's a constitutional issue, of course, but, uh, uh, you know, encourage the court to revisit it. I think that happens occasionally with, in the sort of dialogue between the branches. So, uh, you know, being upfront about it, I think that there's nothing certainly uh, impermissible about, about that. Okay, thank you. That's, that's, sure. that's interesting. And then, especially if we, tie it to the time of the pandemic, at least for starters. Right. Yeah. Hmm. There was one uh, just interesting following up on uh, Representative Lalonde's sort of point about the holding of the Peterson case that the, it is, I don't know if you had a chance to look at it already, uh, but I was sort of pointed in that direction by one of the uh, written submissions that one of the witnesses made earlier in the week but Justice uh, Dooley wrote a concurrent, uh, sorry, a dissenting opinion in uh, a more recent case in 1990, which he discussed the Peterson case quite a bit. And he, he referred to it uh, as the holding of the case a couple of different times. Um, so again, not, that's not a controlling decision of the court either, that that's was the holding, but 
um, you know, it's always nice to feel like I, I, I'm not the only one with that opinion. <laughs> And actually, I put that in. I submitted uh, uh, something for, to Evan for posting that had a, sort of a summary of research uh, that I had done on this short. Obviously, didn't have a lot of time to do it, but uh, um, well, you're I quoted good, that language from in there. You're in good company with Justice Dooley, so <laughs> right. That's what I was hoping. No, oh, thank you. And and it would be good to get the language, the Senate language, as well, or the letter, or whatever you were referring to, so we could we could all. Um, look at it. Um, I'd like to open this up to other committee members in terms of, or I'm sorry, Eric, um, was there anything else on this that you wanted to, I don't want to cut you off that you wanted no, to. No, not at all. No, okay. absolutely. Um, thank you. Yeah, thank you. So committee members, just thoughts, feedback, including questions for Eric, um, Tom, and then I think Barbara, you're yep. Okay, Tom and Barbara. Thank you. Uh, I, I had an idea of Eric's feelings, because usually if we have a constitutional issue, he'll preface it by saying it may be, it could be, that type of thing. And yesterday it was just, it was boom. <laughs> there was no no maybe or could be, but there was the the howevers, you know, there's there's always some howevers in there with that stuff. But, um, so, but anyway, I, I got a real... Uh, clear uh, um, idea of, of where he was, where he was going, but uh, it, just some other thoughts that I had, you know, with a, a 12 compared to a six is, uh, I mean, there was some good arguments made both ways yesterday, um, um, but it wouldn't, it seems, and, and maybe I'm off, but it, it seems like in the legislature, uh, uh, compared to what we used to do, you know, with things like boards and commissions and studies, to, to me, it seems like those, those boards, commissions and studies, there's more and more people, uh, you know, there's bigger numbers um, on those boards. And it, it, and it for good reason, for good reason, it, it gives a, a, you know, a more perspective, uh, you know, just a broader outlook on things. Uh, you know, as far as ideas goes, you know, go and, and decisions. And I kind of look at a, a 12 person compared to a six the same way. Um, you know, uh, I, I guess you could almost say the chances would be double of, of that one person. It's going to hold, maybe not the right word, but it's going to hold out in a decision maybe because of something they see. And, and uh, you know, and that's the way that uh, uh, our uh, uh, system is supposed to work. Um, you know, it, it just gives a, a broader perspective with, with more people and, and uh, you know, the fair decisions, the chance of fair decisions. Um, um, and, and another thing that I heard yesterday, and it could still happen if the courts do decide to go to a six, but, uh, you know, we, we have no, no say over that. Um, you know, and I understand why, you know, things need to get moving, you know, we need to get these cases heard, but, uh, you know, something that was, that was brought up yesterday that I, you know, that I have a fear is if this six person is, if we do, if, if they do go to a six person and it's challenged, um, you know, in the, this, uh, you know, the, it's appealed. And the Supreme Court, you know, overturns all those cases that were that were heard with the with the six person juries. Uh, they're going to have to be redone. And, you know, it's uh, it's the hurrier I go, the behinder I get syndrome almost because, uh, you know, go to a six to get things moving. But then in the end, if, if it's overturned, we're back at square one and even further behind than we were. Um, but anyway, I, I, I think it's the right decision uh, not to, you know, not to push this along and, uh, and, uh, and, and let the courts make their own decision. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Uh, Barbara. Um, so I'm not that far off from where Tom is. It's, and again, I missed a lot of the testimony, which I still um, really need to find um, the time to watch over the weekend. Um, I sent a few articles. I know um, uh, the attorney from DRM was going to send us stuff, but I 
like part of me doesn't want to wait. So um, it seems risky to me. And um, it would be hard not to blame the losing side is going to have a hard time not thinking that that was a factor. Uh, I mean, um, we wouldn't say, look, it's really difficult now, so we're only going to allow each side one witness. We wouldn't say, you know what, like, let's not have the judge there or the court report. Like, so certain things we wouldn't accept. And I'm not convinced about the jury size as something that we that we would accept. Um, so I'd rather even support technology to have it done electronically or something than to give up on the size at this point. Yeah, I am. Um, this, this is interesting. I'm not sure where I land actually. Um, you know, in, in terms of at, at some one point, I forget who asked, but somebody said, what if this committee was cut in half? Um, and then I thought, well, the Senate has um, five members on their committees, right? And and they certainly um, give their work um, thought and deliberation. And I, I see those laughing faces, but, but no, right? Um, mm -hmm. And then somebody also said, well, if it did go into effect that, that folks would wait a while before they did bring their cases or it would take take a while anyway. So, but I, but I did think I appreciated your question, Tom, yesterday about would those cases be, re be reversed? So that's yeah, an interesting discussion. Uh, uh, Maxine, I, I wasn't laughing at you, but it was a little banter that Martin and I had going on. And I see Martin's hand up. Maybe he wants to talk about it. <laughs> well, I, I was actually going to call on some other folks that haven't, haven't spoken yet, but if, I don't know. I, if you can hold that thought. I can um, hold and, and I have a different thought, but it's in response to something Tom said, but I can hold it. Okay, because Felicia, Coach, and then Martin. There's Dan Mute. Um, yeah, I just, I, I really fall in with, with Tom and Barbara on this. I just don't think that changing the size of the jury is going to be something that gets us further ahead. I mean, there's likely to be all kinds of issues with it. And I just, I don't think that's a move for us to make at, at, at any point. If there were to be a decision like this, I think it has to come from the judiciary. Um, so I don't know, I just, I'm very hesitant to, to move forward with anything like this. Thank you, appreciate you, thank you. You're weighing in, um, Coach, and then Martin. I guess my 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 first thought goes back to uh, the comment made about um, you know the the size of the two bodies, you know, as far as the Senate and the House, uh, and that part of the discussion about being able to be uh, to get more voices and input into the decision by virtue of an 11 versus a five. Uh, and that same question comes up a little bit, you know, with the jury piece. You know, I, I think, um, you know, listen, listening to and looking at, you know, the precedents that have been, um, raised as well, you know, creates some concern about those attorneys that would, in support of their client, appeal, you know, the cases, and then not knowing what the outcome might be, you know, with, uh, uh, you know, the Supreme Court, you know, here in Vermont, uh, that 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 that's too much gray area, uh, it, and I think where it has been allowed, uh, and in the certain types of cases where it 
the judiciary has been able to do that. I would say, you know, that decision, very similar to what Felicia said, you know, is up to the judiciary in a way. Uh, we heard from uh, Judge Grierson about the physical uh, adaptation, you know, of the courts. You know, I liken it very much to certain schools that were able to function a lot quicker in the pandemic than others uh, because they made the structural uh, adjustments and it it is workable and it is safe. We heard that from Judge Grierson yesterday. If, for an example, in Wyndham Court, and, and those of us that are familiar with that building and other buildings around the state know how the courtrooms are set up. So basically, there's it's a three-story building, and there's three available full-size courtrooms. Well, in order to do a 12-person case, what Judge Grierson was saying, it would take all three courtrooms. So... What, you know, has occurred is, you know, from a logistical perspective is the timing and number of cases that will be able to be heard uh, is going to have to be facilitated by those physical plants that can accept it. And and he did share which ones, uh, but but knowing how they're set up, it, it, it only makes sense. So. The, the other comment that came up in the testimony was uh, just a, Justice Eden, Eaton uh, is working uh, on that mock trial. Uh, and that mock trial might answer a lot of the logistical questions as well, because that goes back to what Barbara was talking about and Felicia about the electronics, uh, because it's go going to utilize technology as well as physical uh, space. Um, so that'll be fascinating to see what that result is. But to make a long story short, I think that, you know, we really need to rely on the judiciary itself rather than, um, than statutorily creating a possible judicial problem <laughs> you know I guess that's the easiest way but th those are just my thoughts thank you I appreciate it and I'm beginning to hear some <laughs> common thinking here uh Martin so um just a couple thoughts and then and then also just want to address one one point that uh, we heard from testimony yesterday and uh and Tom mentioned but so I mean I'm looking at this, and I mentioned this yesterday. This is this is there's really two prongs to this. It's an access to justice issue, uh, and it's a safety issue. And on the access to justice component of it, um, right now the courts are saying that the criminal trials are what's going to take precedence, as they should. Absolutely, they should take precedence, and and absolutely, uh, I find that the. Uh, opinions that are out there are absolutely binding that it has to be 12 person uh, jury as, as well. Um, maybe it's possible that the courts can under their emergency authority actually have a six person jury for a criminal trial as well. But I find that to be a little more problematic because of what the issues are in a criminal trial as opposed to a civil trial. But the point is though, that yeah, we have some six person jury. Uh, we have some buildings that can accommodate six person juries. Uh, we know that six person juries uh, are, are safer than 12 person juries. Uh, we heard that yesterday. And, and we're also hearing that, you know, again, criminal trials just, justly are the, uh, are the priority. But what this all means is that there aren't gonna be any civil jury trials. And, and there is an access to justice issue there. And, and I think Chris Maley uh, hit it very well. I mean, a lot of the individuals who are, uh, have cases, you know, they have cases against insurance companies and they have, you know, there's plaintiffs who really have suffered injury and are not having that injury addressed. And it's not gonna be addressed anytime soon until uh, there's a legitimate 
uh, chance of a six person jury trial. And what I mean by that is what, once there is that legitimate uh, chance when, when a trial is scheduled for a six person jury and that six person jury is something that is likely to be upheld if it's, if it's uh, appealed, uh, whatever the result is, that's going to prompt the focusing on actual negotiations and settlements and actually getting these cases uh, addressed. But I think until those cases, uh, until there's a real legitimate chance that something's going to go to trial, and that I think is going to require a six-person jury right now, uh, those cases are just going to continue to languish. Uh, so I, I find that that problematic. Uh, and if I had, if I felt some assurity that the court was in fact going to order these uh, trials, that would make me a lot more comfortable. That's not our position to do that. Uh, I still think that we could uh, require this and we could have uh, a, a, a hard stop on it as opposed to uh, something a little more amorphous as far as when the emergency ends, we can actually have it sunset in a year or something like that. Uh, I think that would be fine. Now, the issue of, oh, well, we're just gonna have a bunch of trials that are gonna have to be retried if ultimately a six person jury uh, is deemed to be unconstitutional. I just don't see that. I mean, we're talking about uh, in the last years that, you know, as far as civil jury trials, there's been uh, 18 to 20 of them a year. So it's not like, a, I think that the benefit of having, of forcing or, or, or encouraging or um, the settlements because, th because trials are set uh, certainly offset the downside risk uh, that there may have to be retrials if the six person jury is found to be unconstitutional. So, I mean, I do see where the rest of the committee is going. Uh, I'm, I'm hoping that the, the court will do the right thing and actually order six person juries. I know it's up to them. Uh, I, I would probably still prefer to do it by legislation, but I don't see that there's a lot of uh, interest in that in, in the committee. Uh, so that, that's, that's, that's just where I am. Thanks. Thank you, uh, Tom. Thank you. Uh, just a question. Uh, so if, if there was a, a civil trial, could it still be done with six uh, jurors if uh, all the parties agreed to it? Yes. The party, parties can agree if, if they agree to it. They can do right, it. Right, right. That, that's what well. I thought. So, so with that, um, would it, and I don't know if, you know, I mean, we're going to be writing a letter. If in the letter, it, maybe something could be suggested along the lines that the, the court let, let people know and that their, uh, their cases may come forward a little quicker with a six person jury if they agree, agree to it. I, I don't know if that's overstepping our, our boundaries, something like that. Yeah, that's certainly a possibility. Uh, Ken and then Coach, I'm not sure if your hand is, but, but so Ken, Coach, and Ken, Coach, and, and Martin. I'll make this real quick. I'm not in favor of the change. I agree with Tom's original statement and if that's true, what he just said, I'd like that even even better that they could use uh, possible use a six person if it's agreed upon. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Coach Mark, and then Coach Selena, and then and and Martin because Selena hasn't spoken yet. Go ahead. Uh, that did come up, you know, yesterday when we were listening to uh, some of the testimony. What Tom and, and Ken uh, just basically referred to uh, because back to Martin's point, when you know that you're going to trial and there's, there's a reasonable possibility that mediation can occur, usually it does. And we've seen it. You know, we, we saw it, you know, even uh, with uh, Kaya's case. Um, you know, it, the mediation 
occurred three days before the commission was going to hear the case. So what that tells me in real time in a real situation is all of what we heard yesterday was true. And so if, if the court has and does two things, you know, I guess if I were king, I'd, this would be my suggestion, you know, would be to support, you know, the six person upon agreement, you know, of both sides. And also put a, not a, a, a hard placeholder, but have one of those, those facilities as the, the regular civil 12, you know, and, you know, because we, we heard yesterday that there are a number of facilities that can handle 12 person jury. And, you know, granted, it, all of this is a scheduling, you know, like nightmare, but at the same time, it's still a logistical schedule. So that, you know, being said, I, I don't know if, if what Tom and Ken were referring to is, uh, you know, kind of our, uh, our overview letter or something to that, to that uh, effect that states, you know, the feelings of the committee, you know, in deference to um, a statutory change, uh, which, which becomes, you, you know, I, and, and I'm, I'm torn with, with uh, uh, that separation piece. Uh, you know, I, I know there's certain things we can and can't, and should or shouldn't, you know, that's, you know, that's that. And, and I'm in between, you know, like there, but another thought. Thank you. Okay. So Selena and then Martin, and then I would like to um, put a pause on, on this and, and move on given, given the time, uh, Selena. I think I just a lot of what I have to say is is fairly redundant with the conversation. I I do want to say I'm I am open to um continuing discussion on this. I think it's just a question of like, do we have the time to really do due diligence on it? And I'm still just full transparency, I missed a lot of the hearing yesterday, so I'm still catching up on all the differing opinions. I think it's, um, you know, definitely um, when our own legislative council has weighed in um, so strongly, I think, you know, we'd need a lot of time to really weigh out all the arguments and counter arguments. And I'm I'm not sure that time is going to exist for us in the next two weeks. Um, but I do just want to go on record saying, like, you know, we we do need to feel urgency about finding a way to get people access to justice and get these trials resumed for folks. And um, I definitely would if 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 it feels like that's the direction the committee is headed, I think a letter from the committee to the judiciary could be, I'm not sure if, quite sure if that's what other folks were proposing, but I wonder if that's an option here too, you know. I, I think it is certainly an option. Uh, okay, Martin, and then I'll conclude. Yeah. Um so, so I, I just a couple final points on that is is that uh, parties have already for the longest time had the opportunity to go to six person juries that that's 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 already well established law and in a recent uh, amendment to the administrative order 49 which is what's really kind of governing how the courts are dealing with uh, 
access to justice generally during the pandemic. Uh, it, it does encourage, civil litigants are encouraged to agree to six person civil jury trials in those court buildings that are authorized uh, to hold such size trials. Um, the concern is that, that, it do, that we're not gonna see that many agreements to go to a six person jury. I mean, we've not seen it in the past and it does not necessarily, well, it doesn't. It's not to the advantage of a defendant to have uh, a case heard earlier rather than later uh, because it's the defendant that might have to be paying out. So the defendant has no motivation or little to no motivation, I should say, to agree to a six person jury. Having said that, I, I think where it makes most sense where we are now and, and certainly reading the committee as well, as Maxine has, I'm sure, is perhaps a letter uh, and, and let's uh, hope that the court, if they see that this uh, encouragement of voluntary agreement for six person juries, if that is not filling up the dockets for these spaces that can accommodate six person juries, we'll hope that they in fact uh, order those under their emergency powers since we really are seeing a denial a, a access to justice. And, and let me just, you know, it's not just, it, it's, it's across the board. Uh, cases are not being heard. Divorce cases, uh, chins cases. Uh, it's not just the cases where a plaintiff is trying to uh, get some money from an insurance company. That's not what they, I mean, it's all these various cases are backed up. And, and that's, that's why something has to be done. A six person jury is one of the avenues we have available that the court has available. And I'll trust that the court will, will do the right thing. So uh, that's, that's where I am. Thanks. Okay. Thank, thank you, everybody. And I, I don't think we have to decide this today. I think we can all think about it and come back to it next week. I have reached out to the chair of House Appropriations to see if, in fact, it would be helpful for us to have a decision on this, knowing that there is language um, in the Senate's budget. So just to get some some guidance. Um, so um, I'm not feeling like we need to, to um, decide this today. Um, the other thing, as I'm sitting here listening, I'm thinking about um, the proposal, the Senate's proposal to put funding in um, for the backlog for the judiciary. And that's something that we've been asked to support, um, whether it was by the state's attorneys, by many others. And, and so what the relationship of, of you know, helping with the backlog, um, where that would play out in this too. So I think there are many, many factors that, that could be helpful in terms of access to, to justice. So let's, let's leave it here. And, you know, certainly we have on the table a letter, possibly doing something um, with the sunset, tying it to the emergency order, um, or, or, not, or not doing anything. Um, Barbara, and then I'm gonna, gonna move on. Thank you. So um, you raise a good point about appropriations. I'm curious if in their mind, they're choosing between the judiciary's request and the Senate's language. I don't know. I don't know. So that, that's what I'm, I'm trying to get a- Yeah, okay. Get a hand, handle on that and more. More guidance and what and what our role, what our role is. And I, I I have asked also if we should be taking further testimony than what we were asked to, um, and if that would be helpful to the to the committee. So, anyway, all right. Well, thank you. Uh, so, just a few more quick things. H four twenty eight, which is the um, the hate motivated crimes that we that we agreed to concur with. Um, is up for action Tuesday. Coach, as the reporter before, I just want to check in to see if, if you're up for um, reporting to the body that we are concurring um, with, with the Senate. Does that, does that work for you? Okay. All right. Great. And I can certainly, you know, work with you over the weekend or, you know, or, or something. Um, and then again, we decided to take out the we agree to to the Senate's taking out the language on the um, the data and 
put it into the miscellaneous judiciary bill. So that's that's where I'd like to go now in terms of Eric giving you what um, what's on my list for the miscellaneous judiciary bill and have committee members listen and make sure I haven't missed anything as well as you, Eric. Um, so certainly we have the underlying bill, um, and I know that you're working with with Bryn on this, and so that um, I know that you don't have all this this written up, but we've got the DCF language on um, juvenile proceedings that we that we heard about from yesterday, DCF and and Marshall. So that you know that's that's from Bryn would be from Bryn. Yep. Um, we have Judge Grierson's language from the, um, I want to call it the Juvenile Justice Work Group or whatever. Yes, I should just note on that. I, I can certainly bring it up again when, whenever the committee looks at a draft, but I, I found a couple of, uh, um, I think, oversights in that language and another section that needed rewriting. So. I ran all that by Judge Gerson and Marshall, and they ran it by the group, and they all agreed. So it'll it'll be essentially the same, but it might look a little different when you see it next. Okay. All right. Great. Thank you. That's helpful. Sure. Um, okay. And then and then the um, reporting language from H four twenty eight that the Senate took out, um, and and I believe that was Bryn's. Bill, so she would have, she would have that language. Um, there's also, and actually, maybe we can we can talk about it. But in the um, in H one forty five, the use of force bill, there was uh, reference to he and she as opposed to persons, um, and I know that we are trying to move away from that um, in our statutory construction. And um, according to Bryn, that's not something that that ledge council can fix over the summer, you know, like other things that you do. So one thought was to, to make that change in the miscellaneous judiciary bill. And um, I don't know if that's clear or Martin, if you want to kind of refresh our memory or. Could you explain that again? I'm sorry, I, my, I can't multitask and I had to look at a text that came in. I apologize. <laughs> no worries. So in the use of force, the, um, the gender language. Um, right, 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 right. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I see no reason that we shouldn't change that. I mean, uh, it should be pretty straightforward. I, I don't have, uh, I can forward uh, the exchange of emails uh, to Eric that uh, we had with Bryn and also copy Bryn in on it. Uh, but essentially it's, it's not, it's, I know my understanding is that the legislative council that we don't yet have a standard of gender gender neutral language, although it's on kind of a more of an ad hoc basis. When we have new bills, I've noticed that we've definitely been pushing towards gender neutral language and this particular bill or the, the, the amendment uh, didn't have gender neutral language. Uh, Bryn recognized that, but it was a little awkward, but we've talked a little bit further I mean, it was awkward of not having the way she put the language, but we talked a little bit further. I think there's a way that we could say the same thing, but in a gender neutral manner. And, and I think that wherever we can, we should certainly have gender neutral language. All right, thank you. So I should follow, follow up with Brent on that one too, or, or you have something also represent the lunch? I can, I don't, I don't have, we never really got to mapping out specific language. Uh, we just talked a little bit, but I can send you the exchange of emails just so you can see what we talked about on it. That'd be great. Thanks. Yeah. And then once we have that, the committee can look at that. So that's so far, that's on um, what I have on my list. Another possibility is um, language regarding a working group for um, to keep H317, the Bureau of Racial um, Statistics going. And it, it seems like the miscellaneous judiciary bill would be a good place for that. Cause I, I know that, um, that this issue is also very important to, to Senator Sears. Um, so that's what I'm still trying to, still trying to figure out what, what that would um, look like. And as I mentioned, I was talking, I was on the phone with CSG um, this morning and coach, I see your, your hand is up, but we, we can have 
uh, Sarah Friedman from um, the Justice Center come speak to us and recommend other models, other states to look at and possibly hope, you know, help us form this working group. Um, I also had a question as to whether or not it needs to be in a working group versus committees of jurisdiction with the guidance of, of CSG and RDAP and others, but but I don't know, and I'm going to defer to, especially to Coach, who's been taking a lead on this, and 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 Martin and others. So, Coach, uh, very very quickly, because I know uh, I I don't like being the person in between us and lunch. Uh, so that being being said. Um, uh, we had some some modeling thoughts, uh, and uh, Martin and I have been giving some thought to uh, a model that worked very well for us, which was the uh, the uh, working group uh, that we used for SEC, uh, and uh, with some modification, uh, it would give the committee of jurisdiction uh, input. You know, as well as uh, the uh, uh, RDAP, uh, and uh, with the assistance of um, the partners uh, that that uh, have already established that they would be happy to work, you know, with us on this project. I think we could construct, um, you know, a um, uh, a next steps. Uh, and using the uh, uh, the miscellaneous uh, approach uh, could get us to where we need to be. And and when we think about the number of meetings and things of that sort, uh, you know, all of that, you know, can be done probably easily within that framework that uh, 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 Martin was referring to uh, that may be available, but in that range of cost. Because uh, we already kind of know what it would take to pull that together. So, uh, and we and I've got some language that we had used for that uh, that other working group that uh, was very effective that I can share with Eric, uh, and it would give him an idea uh, for his expertise in putting it all together. <laughs> okay, thank you. So. And then, so that would mean that the miscellaneous judiciary bill would need to go to appropriations. But I know Martin, you're inquiring about about the fifty thousand dollars or or whatever. And then also would need to have a quick drive by by government operations in terms of standing up a a new working group. So just things to think about. But at least we can get it going, get the discussion going. And then also by then, um, maybe the council of state governments will have an idea of whether or not they can, um, they can work with us and, you know, and address some of the funding, funding issues as well. Okay, uh, Bob. Yes, thank you. We're gonna have a lot more discussion on that particular bill, are we not? Uh, Ms. Lane, she just Sherry? No. What? I'm sorry. Um, Establishing the bureau. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, that's um, absolutely. Anybody else? Did I miss anything? Tom. Okay. Yeah. Uh, just real quick uh, on four seventeen. We're going to sit on that over the weekend. Uh, what pending? Uh, possible pending. Po uh, yeah, pending a possible letter to the judiciary? Well, I don't know if it's pending, but I, I, I so yes, I'd, I'd like to sit on it for the weekend. Um, I'd like to be able to um, have a conversation here, you know, hear, hear back from the Appropriations Committee. Um, I think that would, would be helpful. Just get a little bit more information and then, uh, and then we could pick it up early next week. Okay. So, so is it as much the language in the budget as well that we should kind of be looking at or having, you know, and it's on page 202 of H439. Uh, that's the language that is essentially leaving it to the court, but kind of 
as far as we can go in, in legislation, encouraging the court to uh, address the issue. Should that, that kind of be out there as, as, as well, uh, Maxine? I think it'd be really helpful to look at that language. Okay. Yeah, and it'd be great if we could get maybe that, that page or that section posted on, on our webpage. So yeah, I think that's why I'm, I'm hesitant to, to make a decision until we all as a committee can see, can see that language. And then I can, um, I have checked in with the chair, but, um, but we'll do that again. Evan, page uh, 202 of H439. Um, Eric, I know you you had had your hand up. Well, I was just going to ask uh, Representative Christie if he was, could send me the, I don't know exactly what it was, but I think you were indicating you were going to do that anyway. It was something that might be used as a model for the, uh, for the working group. It's on its way. Oh, great. Thank you. If you could copy me too, Coach, please. Uh, and on that issue, Eric, uh, is there a time that uh, we can schedule for uh, Coach and I to chat with you? I don't know if Maxine wants to join that, but later this afternoon? Yeah, or we can do it when we get done here or after lunch. I've got, got, got something at noon, so that doesn't work for me, but uh, what oh, okay. time does work for you all? I don't know if we have to do a scheduling on while we're online, uh, Maxine, but I just want to do that before we all get off. Okay. Yeah, let, let, yeah, let me know. I also have calls and meetings at, at noontime, but but I'm around this afternoon, so. Yeah, I'm available too. Okay, great. Okay. I'll be in a tube. <laughs> hey, good luck, Tom. Oh, right, right. <laughs> All right, let's adjourn. Why don't we, let's adjourn, please.